Okay, so I don't know how sophisticated this audience is in terms of AR and VR. I, ex I expect that there are people that know a lot about it and there are people that know less about it. So if I may ask, how many people know the difference between augmented reality and virtual reality? Raise your hand. Okay, so maybe 30%. So we'll start with that question. And who better to answer it but Mary Spio. So why don't you tell the audience a little bit about the difference between augmented reality and virtual reality and where your company resides in those two spheres, you know? Oh, absolutely. So when you look at um, augmented reality, it's uh, taking a digital imagery and imposing it over the real world. So you see applications where you could put your phone over it and other things come alive. Um, I think that's going to have a big, you know, um, presence in terms of storytelling for textbooks and for books, and then also maybe uh, for any time you need additive information. Whereas uh, virtual reality... So Google Glass was augmented reality. Google Glass was augmented okay. reality. We know Absolutely. what that is. Absolutely, right. And then uh, virtual reality is when you replace the current environment completely with another world. So it's fully immersive, you are there. It tricks the brain and the mind into believing that you are somewhere else. And so that's the big difference. Oculus, uh, which you know, most people have heard of, and you know, we just heard uh, Pamela Key recently, is uh, virtual reality. We focus primarily on virtual reality. On virtual. Yes. And we won't talk about immersive versus ambient, but that those are a couple of other terms that are being used in the altered reality space. You know? Yes. Um, so, um, there's a guy named Tim Merrill, who I know, from a company called DigiCapital, and he predicts mm -hmm. that the AR, VR market will be $150 billion in the, by 2020. Now, is it Kool-Aid or, I mean, and he says, by the way, that he feels that augmented reality, where you're not putting something over your face and getting into a virtual environment completely, will be about $120 billion, mm -hmm. and that virtual reality will be $30 billion. Mm -hmm. Is I mean, he's a smart guy. Right, you know? right, right. So. Exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I think those numbers as a whole, 150, I think he's right on it. Whether VR will be only 30% of that, I think that's an understatement. Because when you look at a single company, uh, headset company alone, when you look at VR, we're looking at hardware, we're looking at software. So I think the numbers are on par, but the VR numbers are going to be much greater than what anybody has predicted. So where are the use cases? Now, I, I did a little research about Mary's company, and I noticed that they're doing virtual reality executions with hospitals, and they're teaching people how to do tracheotomies, Heimlich maneuver, CPR, and that the retention rates of understanding how to do that using virtual reality is like 85% versus 20% if you took a class. So there's a, there's a business to business um, you know, usage there. Mm -hmm. But then you think about sports, you think about entertainment, you think about porn. So what's, where, where, is, where is it going to take off? Where are the, you know, so. Right, I mean, we're, we're definitely not doing porn, but I'm, I'm sure there are companies out there that are going to jump, you know, uh, head first into, into that. Because that's also when you know you have an industry, is when the, uh, you know, uh, the pornographers get involved. Um, we're focusing on entertainment, so right. sports, music, which is our background. Uh, we have a lot of experience that we've brought from that area to healthcare. I think the reason why a lot of medical facilities and medical schools are partnering with us to create content for educational purposes is because of that. So for example, right now we're working on a CPR, an immersive CPR experience. We have some of the same guys that worked on Halo and Transformers and others that are building these modules for uh, medical professionals. We have EMT and parents and doctors that came in to try the application and you know they were completely blown away. So we have a lot of these areas that traditionally have been very bland and very boring, you know, because CPR, while it's life-saving, for a lot of people can also be boring. So that's what we're doing is re-energizing these fields. So away from the boring, so I'm looking at, I'm researching Mary, and I see that she's on Bloomberg Television with John Calipari, who's the famous coach for the iconic University of Kentucky basketball team. And she's sitting next to Calipari, and he's saying, well, imagine if our fans could be sitting next to me on the bench during a game. Mm -hmm. And we're going to partner with Mary to make that happen. Mm -hmm. So think, of, think about that. Think about um, 
what you know the extra ticket sales yeah. you know you could you know be virtually in the in the in the arena with the coach and watching the game so is that is that going to happen or is he just you know, you know? No, no no that's definitely going to happen when you look at uh, teams such as the University of Kentucky where they sell out every single game they have fans all over the world that cannot attend the game, and yep. then they also have fans that just simply can't attend the game because they're completely sold out. Right. So with what we're doing with VR, it opens up the opportunity for sports organizations to be able to not only address the local market as their audience, but to address the entire world or the entire globe as their audience base, yeah. Okay, so there are a lot of players, and one of the big questions that I had was, sort of the, the hardware, okay? So you've got, obviously, Oculus Rift. They're sitting outside. I think you could even demo it, uh, you know, today. Mm -hmm. um, you've got Google Cardboard. And in fact, the New York Times just sent Google Cardboard to every one of its print subscribers. So it makes sense, print, cardboard. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. Samsung is in the game. But they're all different platforms. So how do they work together? And sort of what, how do you address that issue? And, and, how, and what do they cost? Right, they don't. They don't work together, and that's the uh, that's the biggest challenge with VR today. It's a big maze because if I buy an Oculus, I really can't watch content that say it's designed for the Vive, or if I buy you know Google Cardboard, I can't wear, uh, watch content that's designed for Gear VR, which is also where we come in. We're creating one single application that will allow users to be able to sign up to the app and have unlimited experiences. So it really doesn't matter if I'm using an Oculus or Gear VR, we're creating those APIs on the platform. So when you sign up, your account goes wherever you go, and it, it's completely but device have agnostic. Have, you have to have the device. You have to have the device, So right. what does an Oculus Rift cost? Can you buy it on the market now or what? Um, and, you know, and I can't speak specifically for them, but I know that you know, for, from what I've read and you know seen, it's going to be a few hundred dollars. Uh, the Gear VR, uh, which I recently you know purchased another new one, is around ninety-nine dollars, and then you have to buy the phone. So you have to use a Samsung phone, which means if you don't already have a Samsung phone, and if I'm an iPhone user, I would have to buy another phone. Um, and, and that's where I think some of the devices, such as you know our partners, for example, are some of the mobile. Um, devices that you can just slip your phone into uh, come, come in handy. So when Google Glass came out, mm -hmm. and we all had to watch Robert Scoble in the shower wearing his Google Glass, right. um, did that hurt the industry? I mean, because it, it, it sort of fizzled out and then, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I realize a lot of geeks are fickle, mm -hmm. you know, but... Right. I don't think Google Glass hurt the industry at all. I, I think with any new technology, you have to look to see exactly where your market is. And, and Google Glass is still you know, very much um, a player in terms of, um, you know, in terms of um, other forms of you know, augmented. even augmented reality, right. So it didn't hurt the market at all. Uh, but the biggest difference between what we had with Google Glass and what we have now with virtual reality is augmented reality didn't have as much firepower behind it as we have with VR. And then also in terms of the experience, I think it's a very hard sell for me to buy a $1,300 pair of glasses just so I can you know, see if a subway is closed or additive information. So for the consumer, it was not the ideal device. But for business, for businesses, it's still very strong for enterprise. Whereas with VR, I can just go in the environment and enjoy a concert and do so many practical things. Well, OK, so let's talk about the societal implications of wearing a headset and walling yourself off in some virtual mm -hmm. environment. Now, I had asked you about that, and you right. said, well, you're not really walling yourself off because you're sitting next to So tell me yeah. a little bit about that, because right. you know, the last thing you want your kids to be doing is sitting in their room with a right. you know, virtual headset on you know, right. by themselves and zoning out. You right, know, so. right. Um, I remember you know, one of the first experiences that um, I saw in the Give VR, which was phenomenal, was having the ability to watch a movie on the moon. But I also felt like, wow, who wants to be alone on the moon watching a movie, right? So one of the things that we're focused on is building a social virtual reality platform where your friends or people from around the world. You can be sitting in the room no different than we're doing now and be able to hear people when they talk, when they leave. So the interactions are going to continue to be more and more uh, realistic, um, you know, very photorealistic so, so it's you like don't feel isolated. Second life on steroids? 
It's like, yeah, second life on steroids, crack, and everything else. It's so much more advanced, yes. So you have a new book. It's called It's Not Rocket Science. So, right. so tell us about that. So It's Not Rocket Science. Um, it's, it's really the kind of book that I was looking for in the marketplace but didn't find it. Um, I, I, it goes through um, a lot of you know, what entrepreneurs go through. Um, so I covered interviews with people that were close to Mark Zuckerberg, people that were close to um, you know, a lot of tech founders that I really you know, admire. Uh, and so that's what the book is about. It's really about entrepreneurship and you know, what works and you know, what doesn't work from that perspective. So your company, Next Galaxy, mm -hmm. has done some work in the medical health arena. Mm -hmm. You're getting into sports. You're developing this platform that's mm -hmm. agnostic, device agnostic. So what are the other sort of verticals that you think you'll be getting into in the next year or two? Um, in the next year, uh, what we've done is on the enterprise side, we partnered with Eon Reality, which Eon is Reality, Eon Reality, which is a leader in enterprise uh, applications. So they would be focusing extensively and you know exclusively on our enterprise applications. Our core focus is going to be music and entertainment, so right. sports and all of that. We actually um, are the official. We have an official site at the Olympics, which we've teamed up with one of the Olympic official sites to create different types of content and to bring VR to the Rio Olympics uh, in 2016. So our core focus is going to continue to be entertainment, which is what our background is also from digital cinema to you know, work with uh, Xbox and so on and so forth. But our enterprise applications will be handled by our partner, Eon. So is it consumer or is it enterprise? I mean, for example, I read that Google is reintroducing Google Glass as an mm -hmm. enterprise-only application. Mm -hmm. So is that mm -hmm. where the riches lie in VR and AR? Um, I believe in AR, um, it's more suited for enterprise applications. Yes. But VR, the main play is consumer. You know, the main play for VR is, is got to be consumers because it makes sense. When you look at things like music, you know, with massive appeal, you take an artist like Rihanna who has 80 million fans. I mean, that's like four or five different countries combined. Um, so when you create one concert for such an artist and her fan base can attend, very instantly you're going to be able to reach those, you know, billions and billions of users. So I believe that AR has more of an enterprise play, but VR, you know, it's, a, it's more of a consumer play. At least for us, it is. Have any wild, uh, uh, widely followed entertainers on, on social um, mm -hmm. adopted AR or started promoting it? Are any of them affiliated with, with you know, any of the companies that are in, in the space right now? Or? Um, you, we're, I mean, at least with us, we have a major label that we've partnered with. Yeah. So, and you know, they have artists that make up over 30% of Facebook's audience. So these are huge, huge artists. Um, and so we're going to start, you know, releasing these concerts starting in Q1. So, and the artists love, you know, VR once they put on the headset. I mean, we've had probably seen tens of thousands of people. Um, experience some of the content that we're producing, experience just content in VR period, and I haven't had one person, you know, run out to the bathroom and throw up yet. Everybody's, you know, reaction is usually wow. So, and it's the same with the artists that we're working with. They're very, very excited about, you know, the opportunity to have their fans be that close, you know, watch them from the stage or, you know, be able to experience their, you know, their music in so many different ways. So Mark Zuckerberg's investment in Oculus is looking pretty good right now, in your I estimation? Think, I think it's looking really good. And you know, it opened up the, the marketplace. I mean, I was inspired by Oculus once I saw it. I knew that I had to do something, but I wanted to be, um, you know, I'm, not a, I'm, I'm a gamer, but not that big of a gamer. And so I was looking for content outside of gaming, and I couldn't find it. So I created a platform to focus exactly on that. But I think it's a, it's a great investment, and it's you know, fantastic that it happened because it really kind of kicked off this whole VR you know, uh, race that we're seeing now. And now you have Microsoft involved, Sony, Samsung, everyone. Well, it seems everyone. to be a very competitive space. So what, you know, what's, what are your biggest challenges right now, Mary? I mean, It's a very, um, it's, a, it's a competitive space if you have a VR headset, right? Because you've got 30 different VR headsets out there that are going up against Oculus and Vive. Uh, but what we're doing is creating content. It's very collaborative when it comes to that. You know, um, Oculus is not going to be successful without content creators. Right. Um, none of the headsets, you know, it's the same thing. Any 
uh, new platform cannot be successful without content. And we're content creators, we enable content creators, so we're not you know, in competition with Oculus. If anything at all, we're enabling them. And almost every one of the headset manufacturers that are out there, we're working with because that's how we're gonna deliver our content through all these different headsets. So we're not in competition with any of them. So I don't know how much time we have left here, but just, I had asked Mary backstage um, that, so how does it work? So, you know, you're there with John Calipari in the arena at University of Kentucky. Do you have to bring in special cameras and how do you create, what, what's involved in creating a virtual reality experience at an event? Um, at, at an event, you need uh, several cameras. So, there, and there are a lot of VR cameras. We've tried out a lot of different VR cameras. Um, I recently saw a new one from Nokia, which um, has multiple cameras, as well as it's the first one that I've seen that's also recording uh, 3D sound, which has been you know, missing in the marketplace. So you need a you know, special camera. Um, What's camera 3D rate. sound? Uh, 3D sound is um, more sound I mean, that is... have got two ears, you know, that's right, 2D, right, you, know, right. so, you know. So 3D sound is sound that is um, where it has verticality, so you can hear up and down, you can hear behind uh -huh. you, you can hear to the side, and so on. And when you're in a VR environment, for example, when I'm walking back and forth, the sound should change in the same way that it would in real life. Right. And so by recording the audio in this fashion, you're able to have that depth and direction. So if I'm talking to you from here in a VR environment, if I'm using a standard headphone, you're just gonna be hearing the sound here. So there is no audio cue for you to look here. And that's the importance of having the 3D audio uh, in VR. And Next Galaxy is in a fundraising mode right now. What, what do you, tell me where you're, you know, where you are in terms of right, investment and all that. Right, we, we um, did an initial raise of uh, two million. Uh, half of that was uh, internally founded. So the founders uh, came up with the first million and then we did a second uh, million and then we're back now um, doing another round to bring everything to market. Right. So. Well, there are a few VCs at this event, so uh, hopefully you're networking and, uh, and great. Um, and by the way, Mary's got a great pedigree and an interesting background herself. Thank you. Uh, you, did, uh, you came up with a way to digitally distribute uh, George Lucas, one of his films, uh, to theaters around the country and that kind of thing, and you have a patent and mm -hmm. so. I did, I came up with the, uh, um, actually I was on the team, there were three of us, we came up with the technology, but I was responsible for the communications end, so I hold the patent for the uh, uh, delivery of high data rate content, and the, we commercialized it, the patent was bought by the Boeing company, uh, we built the platform, the first movie that we distributed was uh, George Lucas Star Wars, um, today it's, you know, what's used, uh, it's the industry standard for delivering uh, movies around the world. Well, great. Well, I wish you the best of luck, and I'm sure the audience now is a little more acclimated to what you're doing, and uh, mm -hmm. thank you, Mary. Appreciate thank it. You. Yeah. Right, thank you.